where are the postcards on Edith Cavill? And she looked at me and she said, oh. And I said, would you just turn around and look outside the window behind you? And she did. And I said, do you see that 45-foot statue out there? She said, yes. I said, do you know who that is? And she said, no. I said, when you come to work every day, do you pass that statue and go back up there every day? She said, yes. I said, you ever curious as to who she was? And she said, no. So now I was really confused. And two of my friends from Wales had come over with me, and they had the car with them. And I said to them, I have to go up to Norwich, where she's from, because I can't understand how it is that people who are working right outside the statue still don't know who she is. So I said, I have to go up to Norwich, and I have to find out more about her. So they didn't have their car with them. They weren't too happy about this, but they knew there'd be no peace in the valley unless they took me up there. And it was a two and a half hour drive. It was 115 miles northeast of, of London. And we got up there and we checked into a hotel called the Maid's Head. And interestingly enough, later on, I found out that that was called the Edith Cavill House. And I looked outside the following morning out the window and I saw this kind of activity going on at the church below. And I, I was curious. I, I couldn't understand what was going on. I got dressed. I ran down there and I said, What's, what's going on down here? And they said, you don't know? And I said, no, I just went into town last night. They said, this is the 90th anniversary of Edith Cavill's death. And I went, the 90th? And they said, yes. They said, why not the 100th? And they said, well, look at us. We're not going to be around for the 100th. There are plenty of soldiers that were there. They were all with their medals. You see two sets of medals on this man's chest. And one is his and one is his father's. They carry their, their medals and their father's medals. And um, this is Stan Bullock, a very proud man, and he's one of the flag bearers. And there were, there were soldiers there from that were on crutches and canes and walkers, but they were all there to honor Edith Cavill. So then I went into the church where they're having a ceremony, and there was over a thousand people there, and there wasn't a seat to be found. And I managed to get someone to move over a bit so I could squeeze in. And I audio taped the minister's eulogy. And in the back of the book is that eulogy. I, I brought it down to three paragraphs. I synopsized it. It was five pages when I transcribed it. And, and I, I was blown away when I saw all this going on. I went, my god, I've gone from utter obscurity to like a thousand people sitting here you know, honoring her. After the ceremony, we went behind where she's buried. She's buried behind this church all by herself, a very lone grave site. There's no other grave sites in the area. It's just hers, a single cross. And they did a little eulogy and they did a little flag bearer, and it was all over with. Someone walked up to me and said, I can tell by the way you talk that you're an American. <laughs> and I smiled and I said, Yes, because we do this to the Brits all the time. I can tell that you're a Brit. <laughs> and um, and I, I said, Yes. She said, Well, what's an American doing here honoring a British nurse? And I said, Well, I'm a nurse, and I believe that Edith Cavill represents nurses in every country. Every nurse would understand why Edith did what she did, and they would do the same. And she looked at me, and she put her hand on my face, and she said, stop. And I looked between her fingers, and I thought, oh my god, what did I just do? Did I just create an international incident? They're going to cart me off. They're going to take my passport. I'm going to end up in the consulate. My mind's worrying. And she says, camera. And a man comes up with a camera in my face, and she put a microphone underneath me, and she said, say it again. You're on the BBC News. So I, interestingly enough, I, I did get to hear that on the news, and I was the only one they interviewed, which I thought was kind of interesting. Then I went back another year, and I decided it was time to research this woman. And one of the places I went to is the Imperial War Museum. How many of you have been there, the Imperial War Museum? You have it? Nobody here? <laughs> well, you're all young. You have this ahead of you. <laughs> the Imperial War Museum actually um, used to be an, an old um, Assane asylum, believe it or not, and then it has been changed over into a war museum. And um, they recently they retrofitted it because we're now in the centennial for World War One. And they retrofitted it and uh, for World War I, and they have a lot of interesting things in World War I. But one of the things they do have is uh, memorabilia for Edith Cavill. Um, I, I talked to the archivist and asked her if she would have them ready for me when I got there. And this is one of the letters that Edith wrote to her mother. She was an inveterate letter writer. And I was standing there, and I was sitting, and I was holding the letter, the very letters in my hand, and I was just, I felt so humbled. And I looked at the archivist and I said, um, can I have copies of these letters? And she said, yes. So I handed her my American Express card, and I handed her the boxes of letters 
and she copped them all and when I got home, they were waiting for me, along with a big fat American Express bill. <laughs> but when I when I talk about the, the letters or when I put the letters in the book, those letters are actually from the real letters. I did not change them. I had to beat off all the editors who wanted to edit them out, you know, because she writes in dashes, interestingly enough. Mm. She writes in dashes and um, she has a very unique way in which she stylizes her her um, her sentence structure. And all of my editors wanted to re-edit it. And I kept saying, no, 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 hands off. That is her letter. That's the way she wrote it. That's the way it goes in. And we're just going to have to somehow live through it for my editors who wanted to make them all perfect. This cap is also there. And the reason why this cap is important is that the caps prior to this were the flying nun starchy things. You know, I, mean, I can't imagine working in that. But she created the first cap that was comfortable, that could be washed, and was the beginning of our modern caps today. She did the same thing with uniforms as well. We'll look at those later on. Also in the museum, interestingly enough, is her favorite dog, Jack. Now this actually is the real dog, Jack. So for lack of a Better term, he is preserved in the in the um, in the museum. The other place that I had to go to to research was Belgium, and this young man was given to me from the European Union. I did not know when I had contacted the European Union when I started out. I thought I actually had a travel agency, and I found out actually quite by accident that no, I did not contact a travel agency. I contacted the European Union. And, um, but they gave me Oliver, who was an intern there. He could speak five languages. He's German and French and a few other things. And, um, and he went around Belgium with me. One of the places I wanted to go to was this place here, which is one, it's a conglomerate of five hospitals that are named after Edith Cavill. The hospital that she founded is gone, and its place is this conglomerate of hospitals, which is pretty amazing. And one of the things that happened with him is that he went up to the director of nursing and he asked if there was any archives or anything of nursing that I could see. And he came back down and he had with him a, um, this in his hand. And he held, he held it behind him and he said, the director of nursing has nothing to offer you but one thing. And I said, well, what's the one thing? And he said, it's this. Now, this is a wonderful, um, a wonderful magazine or, or booklet or whatever you want to call it. And I loved it because it has her drawings in here, and I've not seen these anywhere else. There isn't any other place that I've seen them. And the pictures are just magnificent. It's in French and English as well. And I, I first saw this at the Royal London Hospital, and I asked the archivist there if I could have a copy, and he said, no, we only have two left. So I said, um, OK, well, I'll get it off the internet. He said, no, you won't. And I went, well, why won't I? And he said, because people are hanging on to these. These are collector's items. They're not putting it back in on, onto the internet. So I tried to get it, and he was right. I could not get it anywhere. And along comes Oliver puts this out from behind him and he says, seven euros, are you willing to pay for it? I couldn't get it out of my pocket fast enough. And I said, yes, yes. And I got this, this beautiful um, piece that I had been coveting for about over a year. And I found out that as I was going along and researching her, that things like this kept happening over and over again, interestingly enough. Outside that hospital is this wonderful um, statue, and it's her name and Marie de Page's name. We'll talk about that in a minute, who Marie de Page is. So the question is, where did Edith's journey begin? Edith's journey began here, outside of Norwich. I showed you where Norwich was. Swarteston is five miles outside. It's obviously a rural place. Um, it's just a little country place. This is her family. She has one brother, two sisters. Her father is an is a Anglican minister. And um, she is in the upper left. It's kind of hard to see. She's a bit faded out. But this is the place in which they lived. And this room is the actual room in which she was born. Um, it's very rare that you get inside this room. I just happened to get into it last year because I was with the historian for Edith Cavill, and he knew the person who now owns this, and we got upstairs and I was able to get this picture. So Edith, Edith was probably the babysitter with her two sisters and her brother. This picture that you see here is one of the pictures that's in my children's book. The children's book just was launched this last Friday for ages 8 to 11. 
And my artist is from New Zealand. He did 15 original drawings, and this is one of them. This is the beautiful little church, St. Mary's, that her father was the uh, vicar in. And you can see from the bottom that it's not a very big place. And I always imagine when I'm there, those, those wooden seats. And I imagine her sitting there as a child squirming as her sermon was, as her father was giving a sermon that was much too long. And the back of it is this, this window now, which is dedicated to her. And it's a beautiful stained glass window. The parents are both buried outside that church, but Edith, as I showed to you, is buried outside the church up in Norwich. So in order to understand Edith, you have to understand what makes her tick. And what makes her tick is this. Someday, somehow, I'm going to do something useful, something for people. They are, most of them, so helpless, so hurt, and so unhappy. And when you understand that this is what drives Edith, then you understand everything else that she did from here on out when you read the book. You also understand why she decided to go to school in this school. Now, how many of you saw uh, Call the Midwife? Watching that? Great, isn't it? Call the Midwife. Call the Midwife. Right. Remember how they keep talking about the London? The London is in Whitechapel, the London the other. This is the London. It's now called the Royal London because everything in the UK is royal. I don't care what it is. It could be the barber, it could be the cat cleaner, it could be the vet. It's always the royal. Everything's royal. So it's now the Royal London Hospital. But this is the London Hospital that they talk about in uh, Call of Midwife. The reason why she chose this hospital instead of any other hospital in the UK, she could pick anyone she wanted to, is that this one is one of the poorest hospitals in the UK. It's kind of like our old Boston city. And this is where the immigrants come in, don't have the money to move on, and this is where they're the most needy, and that's where she wanted to be. This is a very tough place to be a nurse. In charge of her school was Miss Eva Lux, her in black here. Um, Eva was a tough old lady. She wanted to make sure that everything was professional. She wanted to create a profession of nursing, and she didn't stand for any nonsense whatsoever. Um, actually, Florence Nightingale was on the board at this time and was helping with the curriculum. So what was it like to be a nurse during those days? How many nurses do I have here? One, two, three, four. Four nurses. Well, <clears throat> Um, many of us remember what it was like to be a nurse a couple decades ago, but this is what it was like almost 100 years ago. You lived in the nurses' quarters in Florida or Rome. Your salary was about 18 bucks and uh, 20 the following year. Your shift went from 7 in the morning to 9.20 at nighttime with a 30-minute supper break if you were lucky. On graduation, you would get a certificate of efficiency and there was no state registration board at the time. You had one to, half a day off each week. You couldn't get married, you couldn't flirt, you couldn't joke. So, made for a pretty dull time. Your uniform was a dress that was just above your ankles, and you stood in detention when the doctor walked in. How many of us remember standing in detention when the doctor walked in, right? You know why it's not a problem today? It's because you never get a chance to sit down. So that's not a problem <laughs> And you cleaned the wards and the equipment. Um, the student nurses polished the tea kettles, the fireplaces, and anything else that was made out of brass. Now, Edith wasn't very happy about this last thing. She didn't want to go to nursing school to polish brass and tea kettles and fireplaces. So Edith had a little, little imp in her, and her, father had, her mother had taught her to, um, to draw, to be an artist, and she drew this picture. She called it, um, she said it was nurses uh, as a slave. And so she thought it was pretty funny. Um, the interesting thing about this picture, I love this picture, is that it reminds me of someone when I was growing up who was a comedian. Who was that? Who does it remind you of? Oh, Carol Burnett. Yes, Carol Burnett. Oh, remember, the, remember the scene of Carol Burnett where she was the cleaning lady? Yeah. That's what it reminded me of. But anyway, Edith, um, um, Eva Lux was not very happy with this picture and said, if you're not very serious about nursing and this is what you think about it, maybe you shouldn't be in nursing at all. And um, she really you know, threatened um, Edith that if she didn't shape up and get a better attitude that she would have to leave nursing. When it was time for Edith to graduate, this was the evaluation she got from Eva Lux. She had plenty of capability for her work, but she was not very much in earnest, not at all punctual, not a nurse that could be altogether depended on. She had a self-sufficient manner with sufficient ability to become a fairly good nurse by the end of her training. Well, this is like, this is a pretty bad evaluation. And the question was, why did Eva, was she really that bad? Why did Eva Lux do this? 
Well, Eva was a sly old fox, and she had a reason for doing this. She had a ward called the Mellish Ward. The nurses called it the Hellish Ward, in which you couldn't keep nurses on the ward. It was a ward with old um, soldiers from the Boer War and other wars. It was a very difficult war. So when she saw a pretty good nurse, what she did is she gave her a bad evaluation, knowing she couldn't get a job anywhere else with this evaluation. And so then she would say, as she did to, to um, Edith, well, um, I know that this is kind of tough and you won't get a job anywhere else, but I can offer you a job. I can offer you a position on the Mellish Ward. And some of her classmates also ended up on the Mellish Ward with her and got equally bad evaluations. This is um, some of the equipment, what it looked like in those days. Um, up here, this box up here is a sterilizer. Um, and that is the operating room table. So it'll look too comfortable. This uh, gravy bowl looking thing is called an invalid feeder, in which they, when, when people were weak, they would put soup or gruel or whatever in it and would feed it to them, kind of like a sippy cup. And this thing over here on the right, what do you think that is? Where's my doctor? Here you are. What do you think that is? I think it's a uterine uh, spectrum. Whoa. <laughs> I'm a gynecologist, I hope not. <laughs> um, it's a tongue blade. <laughs> it's a tongue blade. So obviously this is not something that has been um, sterilized very often. So, so what year are we at here? Bob? Uh, we're talking about uh, turn of the century, like uh, 1900, 1901, somewhere in there, 1889, that kind of thing. Also in those days, um, they all wore capes. Um, how many nurses here remember their capes? Remember their it was blue on the outside, red interior? I remember my cape. I would wear my cape. I feel like I could do anything. <laughs> I'm too sexy for my cape. I can save lives, stamp out disease. I can cure infection. I just felt great with my cape. You can see this obviously as a self-portrait. <laughs> Now Edith um, had been working for about 10 years. She did end up being a supervisor, and she did end up being an instructor. And after being an instructor for a couple of years, she decided that she'd take off for a little while and she would go traveling. And she and a friend of hers took off for a few months and went traveling, but when she came back, there was no job waiting for her. <coughs> so she was pretty depressed. She took a temporary job in Birmingham, and she didn't know how long that was going to be. And she was very depressed about what was happening, and she didn't want to go home, but she didn't know the job wasn't going to be long here. When she got a letter from this guy. Now, this is Dr. Anton Depage. He's a surgeon. He looks like he's been sucking on his anesthesia a little bit too much here. <laughs> but um, he was, he did very good surgery, but he had difficulty postoperatively in that the nuns were taking care of the patients and they were untrained. So he would come in the following morning and the patients would be bleeding or they had not been medicated or they'd be lying in their own excrement and they'd be writhing in pain and he was upset about all this and he would go to the mother superior and he would, you know, yell, I train your nurses and why, you know, where's the one I trained? And she would say, oh, I, I pulled her and she's taking care of the garden. And he was very upset and it was a wonderful chapter I wrote of a confrontation between her and the mother superior. I had a friend who was a nun who helped me with that one. It was kind of fun because he's a hot-headed surgeon and she was a very um, controlling kind of mother superior. So it was interesting between the two of them. So he came home one day and he was very upset after having a, a, a row with the mother superior and he called her mother warthog to his wife and his wife said, well, you know, if you're having such a hard time, why don't you create your own nursing school? They do it in, in the UK, why not here? And she said, I know someone who was a governess here, speaks the language, has been teaching up there, and maybe we can get her to come down and start the first nurses training school. So he said, well, I, what am I, I can't have it at St. Jean's because the nuns, and she said, you don't have to have it at the Catholic hospital. We have a public hospital here, we have the Birkendale. Why don't we use the public hospital? And he said, okay. And she said, you don't have to write the letter. <laughs> so Edith and Dee got a letter from Dr. Depage asking her to please come and start the first nurses training school in Belgium. When she got there, she was presented with a series of four row houses in a row. And when she got there, it was in shambles. The windows were broken. It was threadbare, rugs on the floor. The doors didn't close. The furniture was array. It was a mess. 
And she said, how long do I have to make a schoolroom, a class, a schoolroom, living quarters, and a clinic out of this thing? And they said, you've got four weeks. And she looked and she said, I, I can't do this in four weeks. And they said, we've got five students signed up, we've got four weeks. So she and Marie DePage put their heads together, hired some help, cleaned the place up, and in four weeks, indeed, she got her first nurses training school class, and that's these five students you see here. Now, there's only one problem with these five students. Only one of them is Belgian. The other four are Swiss, German, French, even English, but they're not Belgian. The Belgian women did not want to be a nurse because they felt that they would lose their status in society. The nuns were doing it for nothing. Why would they do it? So she had a hard time selling a profession of nursing to this country. But she did. She did. Um, she was the the, um, the uh, matron of the school. But she also ran into problems with the church in Belgium. It was a Catholic country. She was an Anglican, and she was now replacing the nuns, and they were losing that place in the hospitals, and they were not very happy about this. And so they decided they were going to run her out of town by doing, putting this in the newspaper. They said, the nursing school is a machine of war against our blessed sisters, which for a thousand years we've looked after our patients. But they didn't run Edith out of town. Edith said, I'll make a promise to you and the committee. If your blessed sisters will leave the work of nursing to the trained nurses, I promise that our nurses will leave the work of religion to the trained nuns. <laughs> And she continued. So she had a lot to fight. She had to do this. She had to start this new school, this new profession, in French. She had to buck the Catholic hospital, and she had to buck an entire culture in order to be able to create the school. This is nothing that Florence Nightingale had to do. She did not have to deal with any of these issues. Also, one of the people that was very important to her was Elizabeth. And Elizabeth Wilkins was Welsh. And she spoke French fluently, and she and Edith got along very well. They were they um, they really were um, emotionally attached to each other, and they really depended on each other to make the school run. In about seven years, the school began to take off. The school took off. How many have read the book? Read the book. Okay. Do you remember why the school took off? What changed? What changed the whole mentality of the Belgian women? Do you remember? The the um, the queen. That's right. The queen was treated. The treat. The, that's right. The queen broke her arm. So, well, the question is like, so what? Well, the queen was a violinist, and she was a patron of the arts, and she needed to have that arm and that wrist working. The wrist is a very interesting, you know, uh, joint, and she knew that there were two things that she needed in order to make it, get this arm back. One was a good surgeon, which Depage was, and the other was nursing care because her father was a physician, and he knew that the nursing care made the difference. So she did not go to St. Jean's where all of the royalty had gone down through the decades. She went to the Birkendale. This would be like our president going to the old Boston city. But she went to the Birkendale because she said, I want the trained nuns of Edith Cavill to take care of me. And when that happened, the women of Belgium said, if it's good enough for her, it's good enough for us. And they started signing up. In time, they ended up with a whole new nursing school. And they really began to grow and it became very popular. However, just as they were doing well, this happened. The war broke out. So this was in 1914, in June when the war broke out. In August, the Germans came marching into Belgium. It was called the Schiffen Plan. They were going to march through Belgium and go straight into France. But because those pesky Brits joined the Allies, and they were allies of Belgium, things got stopped on the, on the border. And thus we had the trench wars that you hear so much about in World War I, where they, where they began to dig in the trenches. And they couldn't get into France because the, because the Brits were now working with the Belgians. The question always is, why couldn't the Belgians defend themselves? Well. They were a neutral country, but this was their this was their army. They didn't have much of an army. It was a civic guard. It was kind of a ragtag batch. They really depended on their allies to defend them. Just a little bit of a map to give you some um, some idea as to what was going on over there geographically. You see that Brussels is smack in the middle of the country, 
Netherlands up up, Germany over here on the one side, and France over here. The plan was that Germany was going to cut through where Louvain is and come all the way through to Mons and then straight on through. And if you just keep this map in mind a little later on when, when we discuss the underground, you're going to see why that map is important. So by this time, I started to write the book. And I had gotten as far as the, the Germans marching into, into Belgium. And I was stuck. I could not find any information about the German officers. I looked. I went to the library. I looked in the books I had. I went online. And I knew their names, but I couldn't find anything about them. What were they like? Did they have mustaches? What did they think they were doing? When are they old? Were they young? Did they have the Iron Cross? Who were they? I couldn't find a thing. So I closed my computer down, and I, it, was, it was in the summer on Cape Cod, and I decided that I would just go do some yard sailing. So I came across this old barn. There was a guy in white hair sitting up there, no shoes, and dunkery over one shoulder. And I, I said to him, is there anything in the barn on World War I? He said, no. I said, do you have any books? He said, no. I said, how will I know what things cost? And he said, bring it out here and we'll figure it out. Went, OK. So I went in, and I, everything was rusty and cobwebby and, and um, yellowed. And, and I was sort of wending my way through so I wouldn't knock anything over. And I got to the back of the barn, and it was a box of books. So I picked one book up. I blew the dust off. And it was World War I. Uh, young adult airplanes. I said, okay, I can learn something from this. So then I reached down and I picked up another book, this book here. Called Headquarters Nights. And it was covered with dust and spider poop. See, it still has spider poop on it. I kept it on so you know it's humble beginnings. And I opened it up. And I read. This is a record of the conversations and experiences at the headquarters of the German army in France and Belgium by Vernon Kellogg. 1914-1915. It was exactly what I needed. This book was not in any of the bibs of any of the books that have been written on Edith Cavill. I would have never, ever found this book on my own. Vernon Kellogg was a biology professor who knew both French and German, and he was sent by Herbert Hoover who was establishing food for the Belgians because the Germans were starving the Belgians out. And he needed someone over there who could manage the food so that it wasn't just going to the German army. And he sent over Vernon Kellogg. So Vernon writes about his experiences with those very officers that I couldn't find anything about. I sat down and read this all in one sitting. It was, it was amazing. It was exactly what I needed. The Germans were not very good keepers. Um, they would arrest the Belgians for no reason at all. They would put a gun to them, and they would shoot them for no reason at all. And they would make them work, whatever age they were, into the factories of the bombs. This man basically is saying that the bomb that I'm making could, could be killing my son. So life was very, was very grim in Belgium during the, during the occupation of the Germans. So Edith then lost a lot of her students. She, the school was closing down. Um, patients were not coming in. And she was thinking that she might as well go home when she got a knock on the door one night. It was in October. And these two soldiers showed at her doorstep. One was wounded on an ankle, and the other one was shell-shocked. And they begged her to please take him in. Now, she knew that everywhere there were warning signs that any enemy soldiers had handed over on pain of death, that if she took these soldiers in, that she would be in big trouble, she would be arrested, and, and we didn't know whatever else they would do with her. But she saw the soldiers were in need, and she took them in. She could not turn them away. She knew if she did that they would die. They would either die of infection or they would be shot. And she took them in, she fed them, she got rid of the uniform, she got rid of the uh, citizen clothes on, put on them, and then she began to find out how she could get them up into the Netherlands. And she contacted someone who was in the underground, and they showed her the way. But then they thought, if you're willing to do this, are you willing to work with the underground to help rescue Allied soldiers? And she said, yes. Now, this is a five foot two nurse, she's about 100 pounds, daughter of an Anglican minister, has never done anything like this before. But she agrees to work with the underground to rescue Allied soldiers. This was a newspaper, by the way, of the underground at the time, because you couldn't get all communications had been cut off. The Germans had cut off 
newspapers, um, trains, telephone, everything. There was no communication. So this was the only communication they had. So over a period of nine months, Edith began to work with the underground to rescue Allied soldiers. In that period of time, she rescued just under 1,000 soldiers. By day, she was working in the Red Cross hospitals taking care of German soldiers. And by night, she was taking in Allied soldiers in the cold cellar and in the attics, hooking them up with the underground, with the guides, and getting them up into the Netherlands. And the reason why it was important that she be the one to do this is because Belgium, as I showed you on that map, is smack in the middle. Uh, Brussels is smack in the middle of Belgium. And it was strategically placed where they were getting, bringing them up from the front into, into Brussels, and then she was getting them the rest of the way up into the Netherlands. However, after nine months of doing this, unfortunately, she was arrested. They put a spy into the system, and she was arrested. And she was brought to this place, the Tier National Prison. This is exactly what it looks like today. Uh, it's very gothic looking. I took this picture, um, and I can't imagine it was a very pleasant place to be. And she was put into this cell. It was about, a, about an 8 by 12 foot cell. This boxy thing you see here is a bed as well as a table. It was doubled. She was put into solitary confinement for 10 weeks. The only time that she was not in solitary confinement was when they took her out and they interrogated her. Who are you working with? Where do you get your money? Where do you send them? How many people are working with you? How many soldiers did you rescue? And on and on and on, they interrogated her over and over and over again. But she was not allowed to see anybody. She was not allowed to have a lawyer. Um, and then she would put her back into solitary confinement again. The one thing that kept her sane was this book. This was a meditation book. It's this book here. This is a meditation book. This is um, an exact replica of that with her handwriting on it. Um, and you can come on up and take a look at it. Uh, when I came to this part in the book to write it, there were certain passages that she underlined and she marked. And those were the passages I mentioned. I did not cherry pick them, but I took them because she felt they were important, and I put them in the book. The American ambassador represented the English, and he brought his legal advisor, and they tried to see if they could get her out of jail. But the Germans would not answer their letters. They would not respond, and when they did, they did not do so truthfully. So the American ambassador tried desperately to get her out or to, to represent her and couldn't. She was brought to trial at the Senate chamber. Um, I, I was at this place. This is in the, in the government building. It's kind of like our Senate chamber. And I wanted to get into this room to see what this room looked like because I knew I'd be writing this at one point and I, and I wanted to know what, what she felt, what it was like when she walked into this room. So we walked up to a guard that was at a desk, and I said, um, is it possible for me to go into the Senate chamber? And he said, no. I said, all I want to do is just go in, and I just want to see the room. No. I said, there's no way I can get into that room. And he said, next building, tourist. I said, I don't want a tour. I just want to walk into the room. No, next building. So we went into the next building. And I'm looking around, and I, I talked to somebody there, and they said, well, we're not going to be giving a tour for a couple days. I said, I'm not going to be here in a couple days. I just want to go and see the room. No, I can't do it. So I was standing there, and a woman walked in, well-dressed, briefcase, pardon, pardon, um, speak English? Yes. Um, I'm writing a book on Edith Cavill, and I really want to go into the Senate chamber, but they won't let me in. Is there any way I can get into the Senate chamber? She said, oh, certainly, no problem. And I said, no problem? And she said, no. I'm like, well, then why won't they let me in? She said, because the Senate is going to be in session today. And they will not let you in while the Senate is in session. The only thing you need to do is go back to the guard and tell them they want to see the Senate in session. <laughs> and I said, that's it? She said, that's it. <laughs> OK. So I went back to the guard. And I'm sure he looked up and said, what is this middle-aged American broad doing back again? I thought I got rid of her. And, um, and uh, he said, OK, passport. So I had to turn over my passport, put it, had to put everything into a locker. And the only thing I was given was a small pencil. I had a little snub nose pencil. I had nothing to write on. And I said to him, um, a program? I have a program for this session? And he said, wait. I said, can I have a copy of the program? And he said, wait. So he handed it to me. And I, it, was in, it was in Flemish. I didn't have no idea what it said. 
And I flipped it over and it was blank on the back side. And I went, yes, that's all I need. So I got in there up to the, to the gallery um, and into the balcony. And I sat there for about 45 minutes an hour. And I wrote everything that I saw in that room. What would I, if I were Edith Cavill being brought into this room, what would I think? And so when you see that scene in the book and you feel like you were there, it's because I was there. And uh, the details are accurate. There was, um, the prosecutor was brought in specifically for this trial, and he wanted to make a, um, an example of this particular trial. There were 33 others that they also arrested. As I said, she was not given a lawyer to defend her, except at the trial itself, a lawyer was, was there to represent five or six people at a time. He had no idea what they were being charged with. He had never talked to any of them before, and he did his best to, to try and defend her, but obviously he, he had a very weak defense, and they had determined that indeed she was going, she was, um, going to, um, she was guilty of treason, and she was going to be executed. The night before her execution, they allowed this man to come in. He was the only Anglican minister in the country, and this was the actual communion set that was used for her at that time. When he went in, he found her composed. He found her um, together, and he did not. They had a long talk. Um, they sang Abide With Me, which was her favorite hymn, together, and they did communion, and he left. She said to him at that time, standing as I do in view of God and eternity, I realize that patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness toward anyone, in spite of what the Germans had done to her. That morning, she was removed, and she was brought down. She was brought up to a tier national firing range, which is up in Sherbeck, which is 10 miles outside the city. And I, and I wondered when I was writing this book what she was thinking for those 10 miles, that she would never see these things ever again. She was brought down this pathway. She was brought into the firing range. She and Philip Bach, who was the head of the underground, were tied to a stake. Philip Bach was shot first. And in front of her, there was an incident of one soldier who refused to shoot. I can't go into all that. You have to read the book about it. But anyway, she was shot next. And then as she lying on the ground, the officer went over and put a bullet in her head. Now, as awful as all that is, um, the truth of it is, it's not the end of the story, it's the beginning of the story. So you may want to go home and then double up on your Prozac, but the truth of it is, when we finish with this, you're going to see what a difference this made in this war. This is a picture of what the execution site looked like, like back in 1915 and what it looks like today. I actually stood at the very place in which she was executed, and there's a plaque into the berm of the wall there, and this is what the plaque says, and it shows Philip Bach, who was shot first, and then Edith, who was shot after him. Now, the Germans figured that by killing Edith Cavill, that they would cower the morale of the Brits. The truth of it is, the Allies weren't winning, but they weren't exactly losing to stalemate. And if they could just cower the, the morale of the Brits, maybe they could break through the line and get into Paris, which is where they wanted to be. And they didn't think anybody cared so much about this particular nurse, except maybe the Brits. <coughs> However, they were wrong. It ended up on the front page of every newspaper all over the world. This is the New York Herald, where it says Ms. Cavill's last words, etc. And, and here she's got the headlines. It was in the New York Times on the front page as well. Of course, it was in the British newspapers. It was in the French newspapers. And I have a whole pile of newspapers from all over the world who at this time picked this story up and made it front page in the news. In addition, the Brits used her as a recruiting volunteer. And when people heard about this, they began to sign up. They didn't sign up by the dozens, they signed up by the thousands. And they began to sign up and line up in front of the recruiting stations. And this new batch of sign up began to make a difference in the war. The problem, however, is that the Brits were, were kind of spent of war. And they needed, the Americans would not get into the war but they asked the Americans, if you're not going to join us in the war, would you at least help us with the materials of war? We need, we need uniforms, we need guns, we need all the things. With these thousands of new recruits that have just come in, we can't afford to outfit them. We can't afford all the things we need to train them. And America said yes, because at that time, America was in the middle of a depression. 
were also in the middle of a suffragette movement, and the women picked up the stories of Edith Cavill and began to write to Wilson to do something about the war. They were very well organized, and it was said that Wilson was more afraid of the letters that the women sent than he was of the Republicans. But like I said, we were in the middle of a depression, <coughs> and the industrialists, the Vanderbilts and the industrialists, wanted something to get America back to work. And so they began to retrofit the companies, the, the factories they had, to supply the materials of war to the Allies. Now we became so involved with the war financially, because this was all on loan, we could not afford for the Germans to win this war, because the next country would be England, and they would take over. And they could not afford for that to happen. So they, um, they, at that time, they realized that they needed to get involved with this war. And on April 6, 1917, America joined the war, mostly to protect their allies, but also to protect their finances as well, because we became so financially involved. Now here in, in the United States, there was one state that really rose to the occasion and paid for one nurse to replace Edith Cavill. There was one state that did this of the 52. What state was it? Massachusetts. Yes, Massachusetts. Um, this is the um, book that she wrote. Her name was Fitzgerald, Alice F. Fitzgerald. She was a Boston nurse. She was an OR nurse. And um, they paid for her to go. She worked at the Somme, and she worked um, with the British Expeditionary Forces. They also um, forged a medal to her um, in honor of what she had done. In 1919, they disinterred, the war was over at this point, and the people that you see here is Dr. Depage up on the back, over in the Belgian um, king, and over here is the British queen that was there to disinter Edith. When they brought her body back, they, they honored her in London, and they brought her to Westminster Abbey, where she was honored by hundreds of thousands in the street and, um, with a memorial parade. They brought her in the Holy of Holies of, of England at the time. This is where this is where kings and queens are crowned. This is where they're christened. This is where they're married. And this is where they brought her. They wanted her to be buried at the Westminster Abbey, but her family wanted her closer to home. They put her on this train, and this train went that 115 miles that I showed you earlier on, all the way up to, um, to Norwich. And all along the way, people stood with their hands over their hearts, their hats off and threw flowers onto the, onto the rails. This was the very coffin in which she was placed in at that time. She was brought to Norwich, and the pallbearers that carried her body over to her grave site were the very soldiers that she rescued. The, the, um, the cathedral is magnificent. If you ever get up there, you, the cathedral is well worth seeing. There is a statue that's outside that cathedral, and it's this one here that is dedicated to her. And she's buried outside of that, um, in this, thing, this lone grave. Now, when I wrote the book, um, the, the nurses over there were so pleased that another nurse had written this book that they asked me if I, and I also Britishized the book as well. I worked with two people to do a British version. They asked me to please come and spend some time with them, and they wanted to meet me. And then after they met me, they honored me by inviting me to be um, in the actual ceremony of Edith Cavill there in Norwich. And I asked them what they would be wearing at this ceremony, and they said to me, we're being fitted for our capes. And I went, well, that's going to be a problem. I'm sitting here in my scrubs. I can't be walking around my scrubs and they're walking around their capes. So um, as a Red Cross nurse, I called the um, Chief Red Cross down in Washington, D.C., told her that I had, um, I had a deal for her, and a PR deal for her, which she'd like to be represented at this particular ceremony. And she said, what do I have to do? And I said, you have to get me a cape. So she indeed got me connected uh, to their archives. And the archivist sent me a World War II vintage cape. And that's what you see me wearing here. Um, and next to me is the British Red Cross person. And next to him with the funny hat. And the purple was the sheriff. And next to him with the bald head was the representative of Belgium. This is myself and the British Red Cross person laying uh, wreaths on the grave. It's the first time in 100 years that Americans have ever been allowed to be a part of the ceremony. I was very pleased to be there. Also,
also, there's another ceremony in London at the statue that I showed you earlier on. It was, it's run by the Cavill Nurses Trust. And I got a note from the Cavill Nurses Trust asking me if I would also be a part of that ceremony. So that very statue that I saw back in 05, I was now one of 11 people that was part of the ceremony to also be honored to lay a wreath down on behalf of American nurses. And I was very pleased to be able to do so. Again, it was the only first time that American has ever been invited to be a part of these ceremonies. This is pretty much what the, um, they were poppy, poppy wreaths, which is the symbol of World War I. It's the last picture taken of Edith Cavill um, with her dog, her beloved dog, Jack. The, um, the book was originally published um, back in very late uh, 11, actually early 12, uh, with a small publisher. But in a few years, I was able to get a larger publisher who was from Wisconsin, and she submitted it for the Midwest Independent Publishing Association, and it won the award for the entire Midwest for historical novels. I also was given a, a citation with, um, with, uh, at the State House with, with Ronald Leo. And I submitted it for the Eric Hoffer, and it won the Eric Hoffer Award as one of the uh, top 10 uh, books to be written. This is an international award, very difficult to get. Then, of course, we did the British edition. And then we've also done the audio. The audio is uh, done by a actress who was from Norwich. So she has Edith Cavill's exact accent. So it sounds like Edith Cavill reading her own, her own story. But Edith Cavill, how much longer would the war have continued if she did not take a stand against tyranny? And when the war was over, the, the, uh, the Kaiser said that the worst thing he ever did in the war, and trust me, he did a lot of terrible things, the worst thing he ever did in the war was to execute Edith Cavill because he knew that if he got America into the war, that he could lose the war, and that's exactly what happened. There are 88 memorials in 11 different countries. I put them in the back of the book. And I think it's the only list of memorials that you're going to find. She was a catalyst for change, an ambassador for sanity and humanity. Um, also, this past Friday, we had our book launch for the children's book, ages 8 to 10. Um, these are some of the pictures that are in that book. And they're sitting over there. So this, these are brand new, just came out. And of course, her final picture. I love this picture of her with her two dogs, Jack and Don, in a little garden in the back where she enjoyed being. Do you have any questions? No. Comments? Anything else? Okay, thank you. You've been a great audience. I appreciate it.